project started. Um, it starts in a rather strange way my interest in these movies. Uh, when I was a kid uh, in Sioux Falls, my mother took a, my friend and I to uh, the Western Mall for the day. We were 11, and we drove up to the mall, and there was a marquee where the movies were playing, telling us what shows were good. And my friend and I saw the marquee, it's 1979, and our jaws dropped. We thought, we're going to see the greatest movie ever made. What we didn't realize was that there were three screens in the theater, and it was not one title. The movie, the movie we expected to see was Alien Meatballs Escape from Alcatraz. <laughs> so that really did begin my interest in these movies. They've always stuck in my head. and Maybe that's the scar that began it. I don't know. Um, but what I'd like to do tonight is just read different sections of the book. So, this is First Coast Start TV, and I'm here with... Kevin Kerwall. Okay. Kevin, you're here for, at the, uh, it's going to be at the Solarium, but now it's the Ponce room. Uh, you're giving like a lecture of film, prison. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, I just finished a book called um, Prison Movies, Cinema Behind Bars. Uh, I realized there are just over 100, 600 at least prison films that have been made and very little written about it. Uh, and these films date back from the silent era, but primarily start in the 1930s to form as a genre, and they're still being made in, in large amounts today, all over the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, do they have a sort of relationship with our society and, and, re and the real world of prison? Yes and no. <laughs> Um, occasionally, they cross over. Uh, most of these films have some kind of activist impulse in them. Um, they often, that message, that uh, reformist message often kind of gets watered down and uh, converted to something more like personal responsibility, no matter how much the prison narratives talk about overcrowding or harsh treatments. Uh, it's a real mixed bag, and, and frankly, I'm talking primarily about fiction films, uh, non-fiction films, documentaries are much better at, at underscoring the real problems of prisons in America. Oh, okay. All right, I thank you very much, and we'll be following this, and, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, but first, I want to talk about um, just kind of give an overview of why these films uh, matter and why so many people are attracted to them. Uh, I then want to sort of talk about the origins of the genre of the prison film uh, and talk about their development in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Um, after that, the next section deals with the movies of the 1950s and 60s, particularly women's prison films, which became popular in that era. And then I will take us, I'll jump us forward to the 1990s, uh, dealing with issues of race in those films, uh, particularly with the Shawshank Redemption and the Green Mark. So the reality of what happens behind bars, however, is largely unknown to the population. What is particular about prison compared to other arms of the criminal justice system, the police and the courtroom, for example, is their inaccessibility, their shrouding in secrecy which negates informed public knowledge about them. The invisibility of punishment brought about by the birth of the prison has ensured that media representations of incarceration contribute at least at some level, in some way, public knowledge and comprehension of the penal culture, however distorted. The hidden environs of bars, cells, stairwells, and razor wires are made visible in a spectacle of punishment offered by prison stories. A second reason for the endurance of the prison genre involves the unique bond that viewers form with the central characters. When we watch a prison movie, we place ourselves in the inmate circumstances and wonder, what has become of me? What are the rules of this place? What will I have to do to survive? How will I get out? And who will I be if I do? Get Marvel, man for Sentence to 10 years. First time in prison? Third, I mean. Ah. That's 
the name on the street for the Oswald Maximum Security Penitentiary. Um, another reason that prison movies can, uh, are popular, I think, is that they can function as allegory. Um, a point I'd like to illustrate through Escape from Alcatraz, directed by Don Siegel and starring Clint Eastwood as Frank Morris. <coughs> yeah. The following chart illustrates just some of the ways the two genres are mirror images of each other. Whereas the gangster films of the 1930s dealt with the societal failures that drove people to commit criminal acts, the prison films of the era focused on the penal system failures that victimized those who were already down on their luck. Working together, the two genres made a powerful double-edged argument that society, rather than the individual, needed large-scale reformation. As a genre, prison movies beget very few sequels. No one really wants to see the Shawshank Redemption 2 back to Shawshank. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> With the common prison settings and the pairings of white and black protagonists, it's hard not to see the story of Paul Edgecombe, played by Tom Hanks, and John Coffey, Michael Clark Duncan, as a continuation of Angie Dufresne and Red's story in the Shawshank Redemption, Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman. Much has been written about Hollywood's love of the magical black man. A mysterious character invested with extraordinary power who appears from nowhere to improve the life of a white character rather than his own. This is certainly the case in the Green Mile. As John Coffey cures Paul's bladder infection and improves his sex life, as well as the warden's wife's brain tumor, his reward is only to be electrocuted for the privilege. Close. Oh, you know you ain't supposed to, then. Mind your business, Dale. to envision a social order that does not rely on the threat of sequestering people in dreadful places designed to separate them from their communities and families. The prison is considered so natural that it is extremely hard to imagine life without it. Even as prison movies have exposed the horrors of the dreadful places they portray, they have no doubt affected the public imagination of prisons and contributed to the naturalization of the institution. And I just want to finish on one final slide. Lest I be too cavalier, I just want to point this out. The cell on the left is the cell of the Norwegian man who murdered 78 people on an island, the majority of whom were children. The cell on the right is an American supermax prison. I'm not a criminologist, but after researching everything I, I have looked at, I'm absolutely certain that the loss of liberty is not enough for Americans. We demand misery. Yeah. And I think that picture illustrates it. Thank you.